have to use your freaking phone to set up the camera because the phone app is the only way to control the camera E1Z. It's kind of confusing. All right, you ready? In five, four, three, two. Hello and welcome back to another exciting episode of DSLR Film New Podcast. As you can tell, my voice is a little bit out. If you're watching the picture, my nose is red. I've been blowing my nose all night. I am a little bit sick, but that doesn't mean we can't get a show out for you. Mitch is joining me for Planet5D.com. Mitch, what have you been up to, sir? Planet 5D. Planet 5D rocks. Uh, lots of exciting stuff going on this week. Uh, cameras galore. No, wait, that's not true. That was last week. This week is a lens week, I think. Uh, lens week, definitely lots of lenses announced this week. And uh, several cool things that we're going to talk about later. And something that I just thought about that we should have put in the show notes, but maybe you can talk about that on Sunday with uh, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> Devin, right? Dang it. Yes, it's Devin. Um, before we get started, though, folks, I wanted to mention that the Cine Summit is coming up very soon, March 1st and 2nd. That is 10 different directors talking on different subjects that are near and dear to their heart. That is a free conference on March 1st and March 2nd. Swing over to dslrfilmnoob.com slash Cine Summit to check that out. There's a link in the show notes. Again, that is free March 1st and 2nd, so be sure to check that out. Mitch, you have anything to add to that? I, if you if you've got any kind of time to show up and do stuff, the videos are on demand. Uh, there's five on on the first, and then five on the second. You can watch them anytime during the day, so there is no schedule. But once you've missed the day, they're gone, or you have to buy an upgrade uh, to watch them again. But so you can watch them anytime you want on those two dates, which I think is Tuesday and Wednesday. March 1st and March 2nd, I believe that is a Tuesday and Wednesday. So Sometimes next week, right? Yeah, sometime, sometime next week. It's free, so sign up. All right, moving on down the line for myself, I, other than sickness, have been playing around some more with the 8mm f1.8 Olympus lens. You'll see a post up on DSLR Film Noob about that. Loving the wide-angle fisheye style. Uh, this lens is super close focus range. I, I think it's less than three inches. So I've been bumping into things on accident and it's already got some smears across the front and a little bit of a ding on the element. So uh, good job there. Through right now on the live webcam. That is actually, this is right here. The, <laughs> the Olympus eight millimeter F18. I love this lens. Great lens. One of the best wide angles I've played around with on micro four thirds bodies. Now I think with that in mind, Mitch, you think it's time for the news? It's time for the news. <laughs> Wrong sample. If you can tell, I'm uh, doped up on medication right now no and doubt. chewing on some Sepacol cough drops that are making my mouth go completely numb. The first thing on the list here is actually the 5D Mark IV. Now, what? Mitch and I have actually started talking about that. We're hitting this first thing, Mitch. You, you okay with that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I just, I'm, I'm just so excited they finally announced the 5D Mark IV. Literally in the show, no uh, show notes, it said, dude, 5D Mark IV. They didn't actually announce it yet, did they? This is basically no. like leaked information about the 5D Mark IV. Uh, yeah. Apparently, according to CanonRumors.com and a few other sources, uh, 4K will be coming to the 5D Mark IV. Uh, that means that you will have a 4 and a 4 4K video shooting. Do you think they're going to implement the same uh, MJPEG format that is used in the 1DC series of cameras, Mitch? Oh, my gosh. I hope not. <laughs> But, hey, they probably know how to do that in software, so that's probably an easy thing for them to do, right? Yeah, that's true. And they already have the chipset and basically everything put together with that higher-end camera. They've practiced that for a while. And yeah. that is sort of a tradition of Canon to release features in their higher models and then slowly trickle them down into their lower models, like the ADD, which now has the headphone jack from the 5D Mark III. Now, <laughs> I didn't do it. Now, while I'm talking about that, I, I wanted to bring this up really quick, and somebody brought this to my attention. I didn't even think about it. The ADD, when we talked about it last week, is a thousand, like four hundred dollars esque, maybe a thousand two hundred dollars. 
for about $1,800 to $2,000, you can buy the camera that I don't care for, but think is a really good value for that price, the uh, C100 from Canon. And that includes XLR inputs, headphone jacks, and all the other things that you would want out of a video camera if you were intending to use this for video. Not a stills camera at all, but right. do you think uh, do you think that would eat away at the market share of both the uh, 5D Mark III, the up and coming 5D Mark IV, and of course, the 80D? There's, there's people who want specific things. Uh, I don't think a lot of people even consider the C100 anymore. I mean, is that low in price? Yeah, I was just looking on eBay, and there's some sold for eighteen hundred, seventeen hundred, uh, two thousand, and some of those even include the AF upgrade. Wow, which is pretty impressive. And yeah. you know, now everything's starting to get four K. Do you when do you think ten eighty P will go away? <laughs> uh, in the United States or the rest of the world? Um, <laughs> Well, North Korea is already probably at 8K, right? Or yeah. Is... Let's is there and there was that 6K camera that was announced, um, or rumored, or whatever. Yeah, the GH5 is rumored to have 6K shooting, which would right. uh, be a poor man's com competition with the uh, Red series cameras. But let's 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 continue to go back and realize that for those people who are watching stuff through their TVs through traditional cable, uh, ESPN is still most often coming down your tube at 720. It's not even coming down at 1080. Uh, so as much as we love to talk about the, the rise of 4K in terms of consumer content, the pipes just aren't big enough in the United States to get all that content down. Unless we go to end up with H.265 or or some other method to compress these suckers down to reasonable content. I don't know. Now, speaking of that, did you notice that uh, recently Netflix announced they were moving all of their encoding to Amazon's S Cloud? So they'll be using all Amazon servers and virtual servers in order to do all Netflix service and no longer have their own servers in house? No, I didn't see that. Yeah, really interesting. And that kind of brings me back to the H.265 scenario. Uh, with that sort of computing power, they could really theoretically start uh, taking care of that transcoding now and, and getting acquisition for new films in 4K. I mean, nowadays, and probably in the last uh, two or three years, a lot of things have been shot in much higher resolution and then you know released at 2K as opposed to uh, 4K. And they've been done in post in, in 2K. So the, that's the entire world timeline and workflow, uh, it wouldn't be very hard for them to spend, you know, half a million dollars and go back and, you know, remaster it in 4K and then release the golden, uh, you know, whatever special limited director's cut edition of all these movies, you know, maybe that's criterion would be the way to go. And you pay for a 4K service like Netflix or maybe a higher tier version of Netflix that would take care of something like that for you. What do you think? Would you pay for that? <sighs> My TV out there that I paid for three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. God, how long is it? Uh, it's 1080 and I love it. I mean, I sit far enough away that even if it was a 4K TV, I couldn't, my eyeballs wouldn't resolve the quality. So why would I upgrade to 4K? Now my monitor that I sit a foot and a half away from, yes. Uh, my question is, let me ask you this. Isn't Vimeo served off of Amazon S3? I believe it is. Have you? So, I, do you have trouble with getting uh, Vimeo video to play in the evenings? I do, but so, I think that so, may be a budgetary issue because Amazon has all the virtual servers you can shake a stick at. Yeah. But the more you want to spin up for you to operate a task, the more moolah you have to pay Amazon for that uh, uh, value. So. So Vimeo Netflix, could be theoretically, uh, you know, throttling their feed to their customers. Could be, because I mean, I tell you, I I really hate uh, visiting Vimeo in the evenings because I can hardly ever get anything to play. Well, even uh, YouTube, if you start uh, trying to find 4K videos and watching those on YouTube, you'll you'll spend quite a bit longer. Even with my high 
high uh, band internet, you know, I've got a hundred meg down hundred, no 150 meg down and like uh, 15 or 20 up. I still have to wait for buffering times on a 4k video on YouTube. And you know, I always have to wait for buffering times on Vimeo. I don't know if I'm just cursed. Like this is not just the evenings for me. It's anytime I watch a Vimeo video, I might as well just hit download and wait an hour until it's done downloading and then watch it from, you know, my desktop. It never seems to work for me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, so 5D Mark IV, 4K video. We've gone all over the place on 4K. Uh, do you think they'll add any other high-end features from its bigger brother, the 1DC? Well, you, you, can, you can expect that it won't be 60 frames per second 4K, right? It would only be 30 or 24. Absolutely. Um, and motion JPEG may be a good assumption there. Um, it would be... I mean, because otherwise they're just cannibalizing the 1DX Mark II. So they got to leave some features out. I, you know, you and I both said for a long time that we didn't think the 5D Mark IV would have 4K. So if this is indeed true, that's significant. And it's, and at least we won't be bashing Canon <laughs> constantly <laughs> going, well, damn, they, they put out a new camera and doesn't even have 4K in it. Uh, at least we won't have to be doing that. Now, one other pat patent that is interesting from Canon, and this is up on Canon Rumors and from North Star. It is a, I said that right, North Star? Light. North Light. Thank you, Mitch, for correcting me there. Um, this is a patent on a moving image sensor, uh, similar to the in-camera image stabilization that we see on Sony bodies. And you can see here, it's showing a system for moving the sensor about in three axes. Actually, it looks like five axes. So full five axis image stabilization. No, 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 no. No, is that not what you're seeing? I'm seeing up, down, left, right, and side to side. No, 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 no. If I'm sorry, you didn't get a chance to read this because I just okay. found this. Apparently not. Uh, I'll let you fill it for me, Mitch. Um, uh, uh, and it, and I'm looking at the North Light, uh, North Light dash images dot co dot uk just to give the full blessing. Thank you. Uh, it bends. Uh, there's, there's the blue element is bending in the back, and it's just a forward and backward motion to assist autofocus. This is not a five-axis kind of deal to make the sensor stabilization. It's just for assisting for autofocus, and uh, I don't know not exactly how much that really helps. So wait a second. Is it bend? It's bending this plane on the back of the sensor. Is that what's going on then? It, that's what it says right here. It says it bends to move the sensor back and forth. That's so micro micro fo focus adjustments forward and backwards on the fly hmm. to improve contrast autofocus. I mean, all right, that's scratch that's all that five axis image st stabilization bunk. When I first saw the image. I was like, ooh, five-axis image stabilization, that'd be great. Um, I'm no longer excited about this patent at all. This looks silly. Uh, <laughs> let's move on to the state. But, but, but I did, did want to specifically bring it up for the mere fact that you and I have talked about how Canon is really missing the boat by not putting five-axis stabilization in. And if this patent indeed is coming forwards, and maybe it's, maybe it's awesome technology which will improve the hell out of autofocus speed, uh, maybe it will be great, but it's certainly not what we were hoping for in terms of five-axis stabilization, which is why I wanted to talk about it. Now, you pay a lot of attention to the patents that come out from Canon. Oh, How long do you think it would take for them to implement this into an actual body? Are we talking four years, five years, six years? Uh, typically, no. I mean, it's again, with patents, patents are totally, you know, Apple gets billions of patents, and sometimes the content, the, the functionality comes out, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, Canon Rumors and Northlight, they pay both of those guys, pay a lot of attention to patents. And I mean, sometimes they will hold off on getting a patent until they're just about ready to issue the technology. So they don't want to give heads up to other companies, you know, that are potentially going to borrow the technology or do something similar. So it, it could be imminent. It could be five years out, like you said. We don't know. Or never. 
Now, I'm jumping around a little bit in the show notes, Mitch, and uh, I apologize for that. But next thing up, I would like to talk about another camera before we roll into the state of the camera market in general. I'd like to talk about the Nikon DL series of cameras. Uh, if you're not familiar with Nikon, it's because we don't talk about it very much on this show. They don't generally have anything that piques my interest. But the DL, 24 to 85, they have the 18 to 50, and uh, I cannot remember for the life of me what the numbers are on the third version of this particular camera setup. But basically, this uh, DL 24 to 85 is using a one inch Sony sensor most likely. Uh, this has a zoom range of 24 to 85, F1.8 to F2.8 on that zoom range, clean HDMI out, and it's priced at $649. Now, this camera is about $300 cheaper than the X100 Mark IV, which is a similar, I want to say the tech in these two are very, very similar. Now, the RX100 is skinny, and the Nikon DL24-85 to is a little chunkier. But Mitch, do you think that's uh, enough to make you save $300 on the Nikon DL24-85? to I don't know. I don't have a clue. <laughs> oh, no. What just happened? Am I here? Yes. Okay, I just heard a click. The last time that happened, the show shut down for some reason from <laughs> from it's YouTube. Live. We're live. Yes, we are. Okay. Anyway, back to this particular camera. What I, what interests me about this is I've actually I've moved to the point and shoot camp, and that's why I wanted to bring this up before we talk about what are you wanting? You've moved to a point and shoot as opposed to a, a no. real camera. Oh no, no, not completely. But oh. I'm going to tell you right now that my LX100 probably represents 60%, maybe 70% of my shooting time. Like really? This camera right here, because it is so convenient, tiny, small, easy to carry with me, uh, requires very little in the way of extra equipment. When I need to go out and shoot something and it's not high priority or it's something that I'm getting paid very little for, a lot of times I'll just take this with me. And this, if it's not my main camera, it'll be my second camera. The wide range on this f1.8 is enough to give you good bokeh in the background. The uh, long range at 75 millimeters is enough for some portraits and things like that. And just general walk around shooting, it's good to ISO 3200. Now, with the Sony RX100 Mark IV, the lovability of that camera is that you can slide it in your pocket and have a lot of the features that you would get out of your pro camera for uh, you know something that you can carry around with you. And my Canon 5D Mark III, which I do, do still shoot on, is right behind me right here. This thing is heavy as crap. It's This weighs you know, several pounds. I've got the uh, 16 to 35 millimeter F2.8 uh, on here, and this is heavy as heck. You know, Carrying this around, wrapped around your neck or on your arm or on your shoulder or in your bag, it weighs you down. It weighs you freaking down so much that I, I've been getting shoulder pains and you know neck pains and things like that. And I've even talked to a couple of photographers that have had to have um, some sort of special surgery on their neck because it's cut off blood flow and damaged some nerves in their neck from carrying their camera around all day. Now, I'm not saying I'm giving up my full frame cameras at all, but when this represents 60% of my shooting, what does that mean for photography in general? Are we going to move to a point and shoot society where they could fit, you know, a full frame sensor or a really freaking awesome sensor into a little body like this? And the Nikon DL 24 to 85 is just another example of that. Well, I think what you've just done is segued into the next story, haven't you? Exactly. <laughs> That's where you're supposed to jump in and say, let me talk about the state of the camera market today. And Mitch, this is one of your stories, so I'll throw it to you, sir. Uh, I, f I found this. Um, my God, I've forgotten where I found this. Oh, it was Canon Rumors, actually. Good old Craig over at Canon Rumors. Uh, it's it's fascinating, and, and we're always interested in seeing uh, what's going on in the camera market. You and I talk a lot about uh, mirrorless cameras, and we talk about you know video cameras. and And this particular chart that was generated by LensVid.com, which I'd never heard of before, uh, apparently every year they go out and look at the camera industry to to put up some facts and figures. Uh, I find it fascinating that we're really focused on like the first chart. And I, for those of you who are watching, if you go to Canon or Planet 5D, you can see the chart. Uh, yeah, there's a, a full link in the show notes for that. So 
EJ post recognized the fact that uh, for some reason the chart is the image is not showing up on my blog post, and I got to fix that. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the very first section in the upper left shows, you know, camera sales have dropped seventeen percent, and that's and they're looking at uh, compact cameras or or. I'm sorry, non-interchangeable lens cameras and inter little bit, interchangeable lens cameras, that's easy for me to say, uh, dropped a lot in, in 2015. But if you look at the charts in kind of detail, uh, especially the one on the far right, uh, where they show the interchangeable lenses versus the non-interchangeable, uh, if you look at the the real numbers and they go all the way back to 2009 there was a big spike in 2012 where there were a lot of cameras sold but if you if you compare 2009 to 2015 the market is still up overall in terms of camera sales so there was a camel hump spike it sold a lot of stuff and it has come down in market share uh, but a lot of that is because if you look at the details, because they're counting point and shoot kinds of cameras. And we all know that the smartphones have totally taken over that market. And, and except for DJ and his RX100 or whatever that was, <laughs> people aren't buying quote unquote point and shoot cameras anymore. So right? where I want to go with that particular uh, idea is that people aren't buying cheap Walmart brand, you know, low entry level point and shoot cameras anymore but i feel like there is a new market carving itself out for high end point right. and shoot cameras that's really kind of separated itself from the bulk of the you know that generic gray color camera that you find on every store shelf for $100 and now we're getting these sort of niche large sensor cameras that are really beautiful and sort of you know i know four photographers now that if as soon as they saw my LX100 they went out and bought one <laughs> so maybe that's why it's evening out. Is that the is that a dollar amount for sales, or is that a number of bodies only? Uh, I I believe this is number of bodies, uh, total amount of cameras manufactured. So yes, it is in in in, in body numbers because it's hard to quantify dollar numbers because the prices of things change all the time, and you know how that goes. One of the most important uh, things that I noted from this is that top center section uh, in terms of comparing mirrorless to DSLRs. And it's fascinating to me that we keep talking about how fabulous the mirrorless market is, but according to this chart, mirrorless is only 9% of the camera market, which kind of surprised me. And that's up from 7% in 2013. Uh, it just, I mean, we keep constantly saying, well, mirrorless seems to be the way to go. And you, you listen to a lot of people in the market and they're going, oh, mirrorless, mirrorless, mirrorless. But it's not as big a hunk of the market as I suspected it might be. And it hasn't grown that much. I was surprised that number wasn't bigger simply because of the A7 series sales that have been going on. I'm not sure if that doesn't count into the mirrorless range. It, it seems like it should if it does not. It. it what you have to realize though and and i think people tend to forget that or at least those of us who are listening in our environment is we typically are video talking about filmmaking and video with these cameras and in the overall market which this particular uh website was highlighting is the overall market uh photographers don't seem to be jumping to mirrorless as much as maybe filmmakers are if you looked at this in terms of a filmmaking only segment then it's going to be impossible to figure out what those numbers are uh, maybe it is a more significant impact for mirrorless than these numbers indicate which is what i think you're asking yeah and for me personally there is a different look especially for photography with a full frame sensor versus a micro four thirds sensor. And it's significant enough that if you Jones for a wide open 50 millimeter F12, uh, you will not get that same look out of a micro four thirds body. Right. Uh, and that's just how it is. But your trade off is then convenience and size 
uh, lens size and selection in general. Uh, there's a lot to choose from in the micro four thirds market. Uh, that said, anytime I go out with uh, professionals shooting photography next to my video production, it's either Nikon or Canon sitting on their tripod with the, you know, the obvious big white lens hanging mm -hmm. out. Uh, it's not just, uh, it's not, in, I don't see hardly any people shooting micro four thirds in that professional environment. So now maybe that's just my American centric point of view. I have not been to any uh, European uh, football games or anything of that nature. So I can't tell you, but here I don't see a ton of, and in fact, people ask me all the time, Oh, Hey, you shoot micro four thirds. Can I see your, your GH four? I'd love to see that. And it almost becomes this like show and tell. And they're like, Oh, that's really nice. Oh, that's great. Oh, uh, F12 looks like this on this camera. Well, I don't know. Maybe I should stick with my Canon lens. You right. Know? And, and that's what you run into all the time. So maybe there's more of that than we think simply because we're knee deep in the market all the time. We think everybody wants and needs a micro four thirds, but maybe it's just not as popular. I and, and it would be fabulous to see those kind of breakdowns. And I have not found anything like that because none of these charts really talk about sensor size. They just purely talk about how many bodies in this case are being sold or if you look at the other ones, they typically go on dollar figures, which is, like I said, impossible to judge anything. So breaking things down into smaller smaller uh, groupings would be fantastic. I just don't know how to go get that data. And before we move on, unless you, I mean, you're starting to say something. Nope. Continue. <laughs> the, the other thing that's really fascinating in this chart to me is – and it typically ends up being a small little blip in terms of conversation, but you and I keep talking about this, and that's the second little chart that says lenses dropped 3% in 2015. If you, go, again, look at the overall trend, yes, there was a big blip in 2012, and when we had a big market upgrade there between 2009 and 2012, where it went from 15 million to 31 million, but look at the fact that in 2009, there were 15 million lenses sold. And in 2015, as 21.5 million. So it's still an increase over 2009. So the camera market is still increasing. And you and I talk about this all the time, that the money's in lenses. That's where the profit margin is uh, for these vendors. Uh, you know, Canon typically sell makes and sells bodies in order to sell the lenses just like the old uh story about uh, razor blades and razors you know the only lenses problem i have with that though is that once you buy a lens you're kind of there isn't an upgrade cycle whereas correct. bodies there's always an upgrade cycle so are lenses like the one-time purchase and then the bodies are the continual revenue stream is that how you see it they are much more an investment. We talked about that quite a bit as well. Uh, but typically, when you start becoming uh, really psyched into this, what you end up with is, and DJ, you're an aberration, no offense. Hey, no problem. <laughs> typically, most people will have one, maybe two bodies, and they'll have four, five, ten lenses in their kit. So on it, yes, you may you may refresh your body more often. Uh, that sounds like a health thing. <laughs> <laughs> I take the shower sometimes. Uh, but but again, if they're making more money and they're selling you five lenses, then they're happy. And of course, if you happen to refresh your body more often than that, that's gravy for them. I mean, I'm not saying they're not making a profit on the bodies. They are, but I think anyway, the money to me that almost explains the drop off in lens sales is that during the big increase in body sales, people were scouring for you know the the big prime lenses that they want, the good zooms that they want, and once you have that collection put together, it's it stays pretty stagnant. It you know you don't sell a lot of those lenses. You don't buy more lenses. 
there are occasions where some you know really sexy offering maybe you go from the 85 f12 to the mark ii version which they significantly increase the autofocus accuracy and it makes it worthwhile but you know i've had my 51 2 for years and years and I just finally sold my 17 to 35 millimeter f2.8, which I've had since probably 2000 or 2001. And that, that lens was discontinued in the, the late 90s. Right. And so with and that kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, maintaining of, of your lens collection, uh, maybe that's why it's dropping off. People bought all the lenses they need, and now they don't need the lenses anymore. It's quite possible, especially with the fact that that there was a large influx in new bodies being sold back in 2012. Um, overall, though, I think the summary is that the, the camera market had a bubble and the bubble's decreasing. We're still higher than where we were um, eight years, seven years ago. Uh, lots of good stuff still coming out. We're moving, obviously, to more mirrorless and smaller bodies, like you say. For some people, I don't like the smaller bodies at all. I can't shoot with them. I don't like them. Now, how do you feel about the weight, Mitch? Because the weight for me has been the biggest issue. Uh, otherwise, I love my full frame bodies. Does it does it wear you down after a while when you're wandering around all day? It it can. Um, I'm obviously not shooting with the one DX size full body. Uh, but when I go shoot, um, like the drum line that I've been shooting, <clears throat> excuse me, gateway drum line, uh, I'll shoot for three or four hours and I don't actually put a hand or a shoulder strap on it anymore. I just carry it around in my hand. Uh, I, I don't know why I've sort of just abandoned the shoulder strap concept and I just like holding on to that thing. It does get heavy. I, I'm not shooting professionally eight hours a day, five days a week, like many people are either. So maybe I don't have the same kinds of problems physically. Uh, mentally, I have a whole other issues, but that's all. <laughs> the, actually, on my 6D body, which is my lighter sort of carry around full frame body, I have one of those leather hand straps now as my go-to uh, choice for carrying the camera around all day. Uh, it saves my shoulders, and I, I try to pick one or two lenses that I absolutely can't live without for the entire day's shooting and avoid carrying excess lenses because I was falling into that trap for a while where it's like, oh, well, I have a 24-1.4 or I have a 24 to 70 zoom. I should carry both in case I want to shoot in really low light. And then you use the 24 F1.4 maybe once, but you've been carrying around an extra two pounds in your pack that entire day and your shoulders hurt and you're sore now i limit myself to one zoom and one prime and it's usually the 51 2 and the tamaron's 24 to 70 f2.8 that way i have a good zoom range and i have a single uh you know shallow depth of field monster that i can shoot portraits and things like that with um yeah. still this though this is the lightest i love this guy and the Nikon DL24 to 85 does look very attractive for those of you searching for a companion piece for vacations and whatnot with your DSLR cameras. Now, before we move on, I want to bring this up one more time. The Cine Summit is coming up March 1st and 2nd, and that will be 10 directors talking about the things that are near and dear to their heart. You can find out more at dslrfilmloop.com slash Cine Summit. Be sure to check that out. Again, that's free March 1st and 2nd. Sign up for their newsletter to find out more about previous events, new events, and things that are coming down the pipe. dslrfilmloop.com slash Cine Summit. Now, next up on the list here, Mitch, is actually some lenses. We just talked about the sales what? of lenses. We've got the... And actually, this is kind of interesting. I, I did want to talk about the. I took a couple of lenses out because there were there were probably five or six lens announcements. But the Tamron lens is a 85 millimeter f 1.8 with VC, which is Tamron's flavor of image stabilization in the lens. And this lens will. I put a price in here of 5.99. That's not actually accurate. That's the price that they're charging for all their other uh, image stabilized lenses. But Mitch, what do you think of this 85? Would you buy this over the Canon 85 F1.8? Well, it's hard to say because we don't have this available yet, right? We haven't seen anything from it. Interesting, uh, there are not many, if any, right? 
uh, 85s with any kind of image stabilization? Uh, there is one uh, camera lens out there, and it is that uh, that Sony uh, uh, Zeiss something crazy. It's like Boit, B-E-T-O or something like that. You know, the, uh -huh. the crazy big Sony lens. That's the right. only other one I know that's in the 85 range that has image stabilization. So, <clears throat> so that's what makes this significant and interesting. Um, we don't know how much. Uh, I mean, typically, when when typically, some my brain just went dead. Uh, what I was starting to, trying to say is that typically, they give us like an F. Uh, <laughs> well, so Canon has offered up a couple of IS lenses, but they're f two eight or so. Right. Uh, they're they're not very wide aperture lenses. They're a little smaller, and they're not quite as sexy as an f one eight would be. Where Tamron's kind of winning in this category is they're offering image stabilization at a thirty five millimeter f one eight range, a forty five millimeter f one eight, and now an eighty five millimeter f one eight range, which is kind of. It's not dominating, but it's definitely a very attractive set of primes that all have in-camera or in-body image stabilization. And uh, that's sort of aimed towards filmmakers, and that's what Canon was aiming their lenses towards. But Canon made the mistake of including the STM-style motor drivers uh -huh. as opposed to the ultrasonic motor driver system, which means that they could not move as much glass. And because of that, their rather expensive $600, $700 range of IS primes are uh, F2.8 or so across the board, uh, whereas Tamron has uh, avoided that downfall of STM motor drive systems and been able to uh, push this up to F1.8. Do you, do you have any Tamron lenses? I used to shoot Tamron years and years ago, but I, they had that stinking adapter that you had to have in order to put it on your Canon lens or in your body, which obviously they've gotten rid of. I have two ta Tamron lenses in my collection. The Tamron 24 to 70 F2.8, which is a excellent lens. Um, originally, when that first came out, I, I was holding on to my Canon 24 to 70, and I worked with Dave Dugdale on a few, a few bits, and he showed me his, and I kind of fell in love with it and ended up buying one. The image stabilization in that is very good. The lens, is arguably sharper than the first generation 24 to 70 that I had and AF and everything else has come a long way since the old days of the adapter systems. Um, mine works great. The other one I have, I believe is the 24 to 75 and I have that in a Sony mount and it works as good as any Sony lens on a Sony body. So AF is abysmal at best. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, the lens, there's nothing wrong with it. They're, they're very decent lenses, and both Sigma and Tamron in general have come quite far yeah. in the lens department in the last 8 to 10 years. Probably 10 years ago when I started buying interchangeable lens kits for filmmaking or, uh, you know, adapting to um, the HV20 and some of these other things, uh, those lenses weren't very good, and no one really – had much good to say about it, but they occupied the three to five hundred dollar range in the market. Now, the uh, Tamron lenses and the Sigma lenses are all pushing up into the thousand dollar range, and people are more than happy to pay those prices for them. Is it really that much better quality with IS? <laughs> no, no, not not with IS. With spending that much more on uh, on, on lenses. Uh, so get away with the cheap stuff, huh? Yeah. Okay. There, there are compromises that I personally am willing to make. The 51.4 is extremely light compared to the 51.2. I would gladly uh, recommend the 51.4 as the lens to buy over the 51.2 simply because it's lighter. It works just fine. Image quality is very good. It's sharp and it's way less expensive and you can invest your money in other things, especially if you're looking at filmmaking you don't necessarily always want F12. Right. Where F12 comes in handy is when it's so dark I can barely see, I can dial up to F12 and still get an image in that creamy out of focus, you know, lights is as floating balls and orbs in the in the background is is beautiful. Uh, do I lock it down to F12 very often? No. Probably not. So for me, 
uh, personally, like F1.8 across the board, that's more than uh, enough for a full frame body. And if you have a 35, a 45, and an 85, that's a very good prime range. And if they all have image stabilization, that means you're capable of getting a few stops extra in low light if you're shooting stills. That means that you have some in-camera stabiliz or some in-lens stabilization for handheld shooting for video. And at $599, that's far less expensive than you would see for a $1,200 or $1,500 Canon uh, 35 millimeter F1.4. Uh, and F1.8 still looks pretty attractive uh, as a photography lens. And as a video lens, you know, try keeping your subject in focus at F1.8 if they're moving around at all. That's pretty tough. <laughs> yeah, you aren't kidding. Uh, these are these are very appealing. Uh, I, I guess it's, you know, we talked about branding and, and loyalty. I, even though I had an adapter with the Tamron that I had when I was much younger, uh, I always really liked my Tamron. Uh, so this is appealing. I, maybe I should be looking more into the Tamron range. The uh, other sexy lens out there, if you're not familiar with it, is the 18 to 35 from Sigma. Uh, if you remember, Sigma used to be well known for their really gross kind of coating on their lenses. It looked like somebody had spit and then they just painted over the top of it. A lot of little like loogies all over everything. Uh, both Tamron and uh, Sigma have really improved their design. And the 18 to 35 millimeter F1.8 zoom uh, is for APS-C cameras, but that is a very sexy range uh, for an APS-C body. And I believe Sigma, Sigma also announced the 50 to 100 millimeter f1.8, which is another uh, super wide zoom range that's available uh, for crop sensor bodies. So both of those are very attractive. If you only had to buy one zoom for filmmaking, uh, that would be probably my recommendation for any APS-C shooters. It's just a it's a really, really good lens for about seven, maybe eight hundred dollars. Might even be able to find it as low as six. Now, the next lens on the lineup here is from Sigma, so we have one Tamron, one Sigma, and this is the Sigma thirty millimeter f one four. And what's actually interesting about this, it's not that it's a Sigma f one four lens, uh, because they've had a thirty millimeter f one four in both the original uh, sparkly version that I spoke of with the little loogies on it to an art version, which is the nicer design. Uh, what's interesting about this is actually this is an, a 30 millimeter f1.4 that's made for micro four thirds bodies. Now, how that competes is this is going to be a $339 lens compared to the Panasonic 25 millimeter f1.4, which you know arguably is a 50 equivalent on a GH4 body, but that lens will set you back somewhere in the range of $550. So for about $200 less, you're getting a little bit, you know, a 60 millimeter equivalent on a micro four thirds body, but it's 339 and it's f1.4. Uh, do you think it's worth saving the money, and do you think the focal length change between a 50 equivalent and a 60 equivalent would be that dramatic? Well, it totally <laughs> totally depends upon what you're trying to shoot, doesn't it? Okay, that just means you have to step back a couple more feet. That's yeah, 10 millimeters, really, you know, what? what is that, like a foot and a half, two feet to change your focal length, yeah. or focal, focal framing? Framing, yeah. Uh, Sigma, it, Sigma and Tamron have really come a long way, and I, I wish that I had more money to buy more lenses. Anybody want to send me some lenses? You just uh, write me for my address. I'm at planetmitch at planet5d.com. I always fear uh, someone just grabbing my camera bag and running off with like my Canon L series lenses. Uh, yeah. I you start doing the math on on the investment there, and you know six L series lenses in a bag. Ooh. Yeah, that's like eight thousand dollars they could run away with pretty easy. Uh, this is oh, go, go ahead, Mitch. No, no, no. You finish. I'll ask my question. Uh, this uh, the thing about Micro Four Thirds though that has always really got me excited is each lens is tiny, and even if you get to a crazy uh, prime like this guy right here, this is the uh, Voigtlander uh, forty-five millimeter or 42.5 millimeter f0.95, this is still extremely small and light compared to uh, something like this. So, and the price, uh, don't forget the price. You can buy an entire set of good primes for micro four thirds body for somewhere in the range of uh, $2,000 or $1,600 if you buy in the used market. That's way cheaper than a set of high-end primes for 
a Canon or a Nikon body. Now, even Canon's regular price primes like the 51.4, the 35mm f2, the 28 f2.8, I think, all those are in the four or $500 range, which is significantly more than most of the equivalent Micro Four Thirds f1.7 through f2 lenses that are available. And that for beginners, especially if you're shooting video, is a heck of a savings. I mean, you need to put your money into other pots like, I don't know, audio, gear, lighting, and all the other things. So anytime I meet a filmmaker who is thinking about Micro Four Thirds, I show them my body and, and go through the price breakdown, and they're pretty blown away by the difference. And, and well, they should be. <clears throat> You're sick, and here my throat is getting all cloggy. I don't know what's going on. I've been drinking hot tea to keep me going, but otherwise it just wants to close up on me. Oh, I w the question I want to ask is, uh, I saw this just recently and I apologize cause I don't remember where I saw it, but, and I suspect that you know this answer. Why Maybe. are, why are Canon lenses, the expensive L, uh, lenses, why are they white? Oh, that's a, it's a cooling issue actually. Uh, yeah, so so an interesting uh, tip about uh, white lenses was originally because of the way uh, lens elements were made, uh, they had a certain amount of thermal expansion and contraction. And if you kept the lens black and shot out on a hot day, the thermal rise on the lens body would be upwards of 20 or 30 degrees over ambient, which is very significant when you start thinking about inside the lens because that is per square inch across the entire barrel and around the diameter of the lens itself. And the elements would swell up and jam the AF system or cause some other things because the clearances are very tight in these lenses. So Canon's initial improvement was to make the lenses white so that they reflected heat as opposed to absorbed heat and uh, if you're not familiar with the thermal properties of black versus white, as far as sun shining on it, uh, you know, go outside and put your hand on your white car and then put your hand on that dark blue or darker colored car and, and burn away. Uh, that difference ended up being a significant uh, uh, mark for Canon lenses in these shoots. And now, even though they've kind of gotten control of that uh, thermal t uh, change, they still make the lenses white because it's so noticeable that people are just like, look at that white lens right there. That's obviously a Canon shooter. I did, I, get, uh, I'm, oh, I, did I get that about right? I think I did. I bow to you yet again for all of your incredible knowledge. Um, the article did very much go into depth. Why my brain is not working today, I don't know about that very thermal issue. But they also mentioned that a lot of people are uh, now starting to either paint their Nikon lenses or buy some of those uh, wraps that you can get to make them not be black. Really? Uh, yeah. So I don't is know. it a significant problem on, uh, and I'm not as familiar with Nikon's history, is it a significant problem on Nikon lenses that the AF starts to get a little wonky I in high temperature range? I think, I think typically that most people or most companies have figured out how to manage that. Uh, I think it's more of a vanity thing now that people <laughs> want <laughs> or they want. Uh, but there was, there was a couple of gals I met at NAB a year or two ago that are selling these lens wraps and you can, you can get your logo or camouflage or all these different kinds of things to make your lens look different. Yeah, the the camo thing, I can justify that for someone shooting out in the forest, but uh, a lot of the other ones, there's some weird ones where they're like pink or bright colors, and it's just, I, I don't know why. Maybe style is everything, uh, and I say that having jonesed over the Olympus Pin F, so I guess I have no room whatsoever to talk. Uh, yeah. Moving on to, we've got two other things that I'd like to cover really quick before we get out of here. And I just wanted to touch on this, the Samsung S7. We don't really talk a lot about cell phones, but this cell phone is offering up some very interesting features in terms of A, low light performance, and B, dual pixel AF. Now, <laughs> Mitch, you wrote about this on Planet 5D. Uh, we've kind of talked about this offline. What do you think about that? Is a $672 phone... <laughs> Worth of that sort of camera performance? 
it's, it's fascinating to me where technology is going and, and always interested to see what new is coming out. This appears to be, now it's, it has not been clearly stated by either Canon or Samsung, but it appears to be Canon technology that they have put into the sensor. They specifically use dual pixel uh, autofocus as the words. Which, which is a trademark, I, would, I think. I would suspect is a Canon trademark. And, and I, with, the, with the battles that Samsung has had over Apple, uh, lawsuits left and right over trademarks and stuff, I cannot imagine that they would willingly just go in uh, up against Canon just for the fun of it. So I suspect that this is really Canon technology in there. The demos, if you go to the Planet 5D link, uh, we have a, a video that was recorded uh, comparing the iPhone 6S to the brand new Samsung Galaxy S7. I have to get these names. <laughs> uh, and the autofocus is just phenomenal, phenomenally fast on this camera. The low light performance too was really brilliant compared yeah. to the iPhone uh, S six or six S whatever. Dang it, iPhone! So watch <laughs> that video if you're if you're interested in this. Uh, obviously, I'm an iPhone guy, and I've I've been stuck to Apple forever. So eventually, maybe Apple will make a deal. Who knows? Uh, but it's it's just really fascinating to see where this technology is going. Uh, and I'm just stunned at how fast the autofocus is in that demo. It just blew me away. Am I going to switch? No, but it's I can't say, Mitch. I do pick my cell phone based on uh, image quality of the sensor. Uh, this is the uh, HTC M8, and it has a very lovely uh, imager in the the camera body. I mean, in the uh, phone body that takes very decent images. Um, I prefer that over getting a cheaper cell phone. So this $672 is a pretty big investment for a brand new phone. And I have camera bodies that I would rather own. Uh, yeah. But that said, if you're under contract and this is $150 or $200 upgrade and it can significantly outperform the 6S, I mean, people really do rely on their cell phone as a, a camera. Yeah, uh, these days, and the better that camera is, the more attractive a phone will be to them. And it plus, does. Samsung's pretty popular. Yeah, yeah, it does. I apologize. It does bother me when my iPhone won't focus on what I want it to focus, on. and it, and it is relatively slow in focusing. The other thing that the, that I pointed out is that they don't demonstrate this in the autofocus in video mode. So I don't know yet whether or not this dual pixel AF works in video on the Samsung. Now, I rem if I remember correctly, isn't the S7 capable of 4K internal shooting as well? Yes. Yes, it is. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, wh what do you even need a GoPro for anymore, right? And 5D Mark IV, right? Uh, I almost put it in the show notes. There was some wacky... <laughs> Uh, uh, Roku or uh, Rickshaw or something like that uh, company that had released yet another uh, action camera and it was kind of a weird uh, sort of shape like the Sony systems but I don't know I don't think action cameras are going to be around much longer with so many of these great uh, point and shoot and other you know cell phone products getting 4k video and having arguably better video than some of these action cameras unless you need extreme underwater support now, last thing on my list here, and I forgot to put the name. Oh, go ahead. I, but did you see that this Samsung is waterproof? Yeah, you can take it in the pool. You can take it. I mean, I don't. They didn't say a depth to how far you can go down, but yeah, I think the term would probably be better said as water resistant because yeah, my right. guess with the cell phone, maybe uh, a meter or less in depth before you start getting water penetration, which is you I know, actually, three feet. I actually have dreams about taking my phone or, or jumping into a pool accidentally with my phone. I don't know why my brain focuses on that particular thing, but it, I, I've dreamt about that. It's a fear of mine, apparently. Well, I have a friend that works at uh, a Verizon store, and he has for years. He's a manager there. And he's like, you wouldn't believe how many people come in with a phone that either fell in the toilet or fell in the bathtub. 
And yeah. it's like, what are you doing with your phone on the toilet where it falls into the toilet? And what are you doing with your phone in the bathtub, period? You know, uh, like, are you sitting there surfing the internet on your cell phone yep. while you're taking a bath? And then it just yep. slips out of your soapy hands and falls in the water. So this is probably, there is probably a need for something like this. And, and uh, there's a case, by the way, that just came out and I, I just saw the video for it that has a, a silicon loop on the back. Have you seen Okay. It? No, I haven't. Tell and me you, more. You slip your fingers in it, and I I really apologize because I don't know the name of this thing. It's, it's oh, wait, is this the phone condom? No, 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 no. Okay. No, 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 no. But it 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 has right in the center of the back. There's a silicon loop that you slide your finger in, and you can pick it up by that. And and so it's it. From the video, it makes it easier to hold. Like if you were in the tub watching, <laughs> it's not going to slip out of your hand because it's like you've got your fingers in this loop in the back. So it makes it easier to hold. And it also makes it easier to reach like the top of the phone, you know, or the bottom of the phone with your mm -hmm. thumb because you can, it's, it's just, it's not going to slip out of your hand. And I, I got to buy one of these things because I have this problem where even though I've got, a case on it on my iPhone 6 Plus. It's just so big, I can't reach the top and the bottom. And anyway, way off topic, but I got to get this. <laughs> All right, last thing on the list here, and I just want to bring this up. I want to apologize to whoever wrote this in because I forgot to put the name in the show notes. But uh, a couple of people have asked me, uh, Devin mentioned this on a previous show, what a macro was. And I've got a link to this in the show notes. Uh, so you can follow through at the uh, Microsoft homepage. Uh, it basically walks you through the steps. And all we mean when we mention a macro in that particular sense is a set of program commands, keys, or button presses that can happen based on a list that you have saved. So for example, if you were performing a ton of trimming options on a bunch of photos and you needed each one to be cropped to a certain size, you could set up a hotkey that performs the opening via Photoshop, the trimming function, and the closing and saving uh, with whatever numbered name, dash, or what have you that you would like. It's also handy for video game players if you want to set up a command set of keys to perform a task. Say you need to hit three keys in a certain order to shoot some kind of special laser. You could program that to one key so that you press that single key and those three keys are depressed for you. Uh, and you can loop it or what have you to have it continually repeat that action. It's really handy in editing. Uh, there is a uh, processing mode in both Photoshop and Premiere Pro that allow you to perform these sorts of trims, uh, changes, or what have you. And a few examples are in transcoding, uh, file changes, or in batch processing. So if you were, say, shooting raw cinema DNG and you wanted to apply the same color palette to a thousand photos, you could use this sort of methodology to uh, work through without you having to go individually to each uh, photo and change it. You could do that directly in Photoshop. Or if you wanted to transcode a bunch of files uh, from one format to another and maybe add a watermark to them, you could do that in Premiere Pro. And there are other examples. Basically, the sky's the limit, anything you could think of. Uh, Mitch, do you use any sort of uh, shortcuts like this? Oh my gosh, DJ, I could not live without my keyboard macros uh, on on my Mac. So that's a solid no? That's a solid absolutely. I use it all the time. I'm te you may think I'm teasing, but no. I, I have a program on the Mac called Keyboard Maestro. Okay. Um, and by the way, this and this huh? are all Keyboard Maestro commands. I mean, I just, I'm using my keyboard to play sounds or uh, I'm using, I don't do any kind of the trim kind of things, although I really need to. Uh, but I have just, I've just got gobs and gobs of keyboard macros on my Mac to save me time. And if, and if frankly, my opinion is that if you're not learning how to use macros, you're wasting so much of your personal time doing repetitive tasks over and over. I mean, you know, everybody knows like on the on the smartphones, and I assume Android does it, on, but on, you know, the type ahead kind of things where it starts trying to predict what you're going to type or autocorrect to fix words that you don't often use. I mean, I have keyboard commands like to type my email address. 
uh, as, so I, I don't I don't know how but anybody can function without these things. They're really handy. Um, I use mine more in an editing uh, uh, format, but uh, Mitch is absolutely right. Triggering uh, multi commands, even just basic commands like uh, Control C and Control V, or Squirrely V and Squirrely Z. If you're or V on a, a Mac, the, those things will save you a ton of time. And a lot of times, you have to type out something over and over again. And if you're wasting that time typing it, you're just you're eating into your own day. You're you're ruining what you could be doing in the future with that time for some other project, some other thing. Make sure to to learn some of these macros, and you know you don't have to even be able to set one up. A lot of these, like uh, I believe, aren't there downloadable uh, pre set up versions for uh, Keyboard Maestro where you could like, oh, here's a task that everybody loves to do. Absolutely. And there's the same yep. with these macros. There's whole groups and their .mhm files. You can find things to do all sorts of handy stuff, things that you wouldn't even thought were handy until you need to actually do that, like file renaming tasks. Have you ever had a crap load of files that you need to deliver in a folder and they need to be named one through whatever and they need to be named with the project? You know, imagine going through and renaming 150 files. That is tedious work. But if you could just push a button and plus one it in the command, it will continually rename all those files. And this is very similar to what we used to do in the old days in batch files, if you are familiar with a batch file. Yep. In DOS, you just set up a bunch of things that you want to happen, and then you hit enter, and it does it for you. It takes care of everything. Uh, well worth the investment. Do you have anything yeah, to add to that, Mitch? There, well, there's another program I use on the Mac called Typeinator. Uh, there's a couple of different ones, obviously, for keyboard macros. But... Typeinator is purely aimed at uh, text-based things, like I said, my email address. I, I type C5D, and Typeinator re... re <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? It replaces that with Canon 5D Mark II, right? So all I have to do is type C5D, or PM dot is Planet Mitch, or you know all these different things that I type all the time I have shortcuts for every single one of them because if I typed out Canon EOS 5D Mark II every time I needed to type it in a blog post, I'd be 55 years older than I am now. Uh, the other thing that's uh, really handy, and I'll bring this up really quick. Uh, I'll put a link to this in the show notes. Uh, this is PCPro or per .com. Uh, They have some interesting how-tos on using some of the uh, mechanical keyboards with glowing backgrounds. So mm -hmm. on top of programming your keys to do certain things, uh, you can also program those to correspond with color changes uh, underneath of the keys. So if you are trying to accomplish uh, some sort of color change for play and stop, for example, or if you change your cursor to a cut tool as opposed to a drag tool, you could have it change color so that you are aware of what you are in while you're working on that. And those combinations really speed up your workflow and shortcut keys and macros in general will make you a much better editor, a much faster editor. And the more work you can get done, the more money you can make. Amen. Great tip. Thanks. All right. On that note, guys, one last time, be sure to swing over to dslrfilmnoob.com slash cine summit and check that out. March 1st and 2nd, 10 directors will be sharing their stories and information with you. Uh, that is free March 1st and 2nd. Free. DSLRfilmnoob.com slash Cine Summit. Mitch, you have anything else before we get out of here? It's free. If it's <laughs> free. if you don't make time to do that, uh, maybe you're not a director. Maybe you think, oh, I don't need to learn what directors are learning. But if you take time to learn, maybe you're just a cinematographer. If you know more about the director's job, you'll be a better cinematographer. So make time to do those things. And they also have a great back catalog of other... Uh, uh, yeah. lectures and topics that if you want to cover cinematography or some of the other things that are out there, they've been going for five years strong and lots of good stuff there. Hey. Myself, you can find me at dslrfilmnoob.com or on Twitter at dslrfilmnoob. Mitch, where can people find you? Planet 5D. Planet5D.com, planetmitch.com. Uh, Twitter is Planet Mitch. I'm all over the places. I, you know, I have my own universe, so just find me anywhere. 
I'm about to drink a small bottle of NyQuil and pass back out on the couch. But before I do that, remember to write a review on iTunes. SoundCloud is where you can find us as well as anywhere podcasts are distributed. Uh, when you leave a question, leave it in the YouTube comments, and that will make it really easy for Mitch and I to find. Always follow the show links to find out more about all the things that we talk about because I spend a lot of time putting those together as well as Mitch working on those. So thank you, sir, for your hard work. We will see you next time on another exciting episode of DSLR Film Noob Finding the Button podcast. <laughs>
an APS-C sensor and a full frame sensor, and then um, I've forgotten exactly what the micro four thirds or one no, inch. The the PSH. No, the bigger one. The you know, uh, oh, full uh, full format or medium format. Yeah, medium format. Thank you. God. Which is different, which is bigger than full frame, right? Which is so weird because it's... Yeah, usually you need somewhere in the range of like 50 or 60 pixels to get up to a medium format. And isn't that a square format? Is square. it one-to-one? -one? I don't know. Uh, I, but... I remember shooting medium format on film years and years ago, like a Russian camera. And uh, it seemed to me like the film was square, but I could be incorrect. Yeah, I don't remember. But but that he was specifically talking about the sharpness, um, ah. and there's there there are differences in the you know so you got a model sitting in front of you at a fixed distance and you use different sensors. I mean I noticed that when I was when I was taking uh, photographs and I moved up from the uh, Rebel XTI that I had, which was a crop sensor, which I didn't really understand was a crop sensor until I, I finally realized that the 5Ds were full frame and, and I bought the 5D and I was like, crap, everything I take is sharp. As opposed <laughs> to a lot of the, I was having hit and miss with taking, uh, you know, focus, getting things sharp enough because I was selling stock photos at the time and they reject you if they're not sharp enough. So anyway, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different things that you really have to learn when you get into this that just aren't intuitively obvious at the beginning, but the more you get into it, the more you're like, holy crap, there's a lot to know. Now, before we get out of here, let me ask you one question, Mitch. Did you ever go into your like deep dive in your Canon menus and mess around with the macro or the micro adjustments? Yes, I have. Have you ever had enough of a significant result to make that worthwhile opportunity? No. Okay, and me too. Uh, I've had a few lenses. Um, I ended up with a Sigma... Uh, 85 millimeter f1.4 for a while and I ended up buying three different copies of it finally the third copy was the, the one but the first two copies I sat around and you know it just wasn't getting focused quite right things were a little bit off all the time and I messed around with that and messed around with it and tried all these different things and despite what I read all the recommendations I could never get it to do what I thought it should do and then one of them just happened to work so I've never done it with any of my Canon lenses because, you know, Canon has profiles for all their lenses, so you don't really need to do that. But uh, uh, it seemed like more hassle than uh, it was really worth for all that effort. You know, this is fascinating. Uh, and, and no, I, I've not done it. But again, all of my lenses are Canon lenses, as, as you said. But it's so hard to do the micro adjustment because you have to have a chart. And yep. you, gotta, you know, it's, just a pain. It's, it's too much of a pain in the ass. Uh, I stumbled into uh, the other day, yesterday or the day before, a video about Stanley Kubrick. And they had his entire lens collection. It's a fascinating video, and I didn't get to watch the whole thing because it's like 20-something minutes long. Uh, but I didn't realize that uh, Stanley used to buy his lenses, but he would that was a silly statement. Of course, people buy them. <laughs> but I mean, at the time, a lot of you know filmmakers would rent their lenses. And they yeah. Didn't always necessarily buy stuff. But the guy talking about his lenses said that when Stanley was in the market for a lens, he would get ten to twenty of the same model, and he would test each one of them out individually, and then buy the one that he liked. And it and that's because back in the 70s and 80s a lot of the cinema lenses were hand ground and so each lens had a different flavor to it wow because of the way the lenses were ground and so he would he would not buy one until he had had the opportunity to try at least 10 of them out and find the one that he thought was ground the way he wanted it so i i, I just had no clue that that was happening in the past now, on that note, have you ever run any of your lenses through one of those like uh, uh, smash and, and bang uh, filter uh, damaging sort of uh, groups? Like uh, I think Dog Dog Shit Optics is one of the companies that does that, to where they they like mess up your lens for you and then put a fancy like brass case on it and kick you out a lens that's sort of messed up. Have you have you ever messed with any of those? No, didn't even <laughs> know they existed. 
Yeah, so they change elements. They Sometimes they'll fool around with the aperture blades and all kinds of weird things. And you'll end up with like really strange colorations in in light coming in, uh, weird lens flares that would not normally happen and some other uh, strange abnormalities. I, I only had the opportunity to, to play around with one or two on a, a single shoot. So I'm by no means an expert on them, but I it was kind of interesting. And the gentleman I was talking to, I, I believe he was paying like two or three thousand dollars a lens, maybe a thousand dollars a lens, in wow. order to have this done to his lenses. And for the life of me, I, I've always been happy with my regular lenses. But he's like, "Do you shoot on any old Nikkor lenses?" And I'm like, "Well, yeah, I've got a couple." He's like, "It's a different look, isn't it?" I'm like, "Yes, absolutely. Like it's sort of, it's a little bit soft. It uh, the colors are a little bit different." He's like, "Well, think of it like that. You know, we're." We're messing around with the coatings on these lenses. We're screwing them up on purpose, and we know what kind of results we expect to get based on the coating damage and, and so on. And these lenses are durable enough that you're, they're still going to provide a sharp, good image. You're just going to get new effects that you would not otherwise get. So right. I, I guess if you're looking for that like eight millimeter style shooting look or that vintage, you know, almost uh, Instagrammy look in your filmmaking, uh, that's baked in, and it's kind of. I mean, I don't know if I'd spend three thousand dollars to have my lens beat up, but well, have you have you ever played with a lens baby lens? You know, those are specifically designed that way. Yeah, with that uh, like flexible middle, so you can kind of bend it around and separate it and move it in different directions. I have one, have one, and I like it for certain certain effects. Do you use it enough to make it worth the what are those three hundred dollars, two hundred fifty dollars? I got it for free. Oh. <laughs> They were a sponsor for a little while on Planet 5D. They're, they are intriguing. I put that in the same category as the tilt shift lenses. Right. I always want a tilt shift lens, but then I have to step back and say, wait a minute, DJ, what the hell are you going to use this for? Right. And I can't come up with anything. And if I can't come up with anything, there is absolutely no reason I need to spend $1,000 on a tilt shift lens. And uh, you know, you're like, well, what about if I want to make people look like ants while I'm shooting a bridge in time lapse? Yeah. How many times do you do that? Yeah. You know, you almost never do that. Maybe once you do that, or that's all you do, and you love doing it, and you turn it into your thing. But otherwise, it's a hard sell. And same with really nice primes. I own a set of really nice primes, and I think I overpaid and don't necessarily need them. But uh, you know, the 24 f1.4, the 35 f1.4, the 50 f1.2, and the 85 f1.2 are all in my collection. And how often do I grab those versus a zoom? I probably grab my zoom more because yep. the 85 is massive. I'm afraid of scratching the back element. The 50 is fairly heavy and the 24 and 35 are, they're really good. But how often do you need that focal rank length at uh, F14? So yeah, uh, maybe I need, now I'm talking myself into selling stuff. <laughs> well, you can send them my way, DJ. I'll test them out for you. They are lovely, lovely lenses. I love all of those. I will probably hold on them, hold on to them for life. But uh, anything else, Mitch? I think we've gone post show pretty far. No, no, I'm good. All right, I'm going to stop the broadcast now. If you're still watching, uh, I might have uh, Dave Knopp uh, from Backyard Effects on tonight. So if you're still watching now, uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, he emailed me and said he might have some free time. And if you're not uh, familiar with his work, he does a lot of the stuff. Uh, for the YouTube channel Tested, which is uh, a lot of uh, RC copters and uh, flying apparatuses and so on. And Dave's a really great guy too. So uh, I look forward to that possibly tonight. And uh, that's the end of the broadcast. Bye.